All right. Uh, to start off, um, I like to have it, my guests introduce themselves, say who they are, what they do. Just give a little introduction for me and the guests. Just go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, so my, my name's uh, Philip Webley. Uh, I'm a professional skydiver, so that means I, I teach people to skydive right from the start. Uh, and also I kind of teach like more advanced skills once someone's become um, a, a licensed skydiver when they want to progress into skydiving. And I do that um, for jumping from planes and also using the wind tunnels to, to kind of help help training as well. Um, so, yeah, so we can go into that kind of uh, all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so to start off, you know, you can go into how you got into skydiving. Were you always fascinated with it? Things like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it, it was always kind of on my radar, so to speak, as a, as a kid. And um, whereas maybe like people would talk of it as something like crazy to do. I kind of I, I used to just think it was just just something that some people did. And I didn't think it was a really outrageous thing to do. Um, so I've, I first did my kind of very first jumping out of a plane, uh, when I was part of the military with those big kind of mushroom round parachutes where it's, it's not really like a, a load of fun, but I, I, I enjoyed kind of the, the feeling of jumping out of a plane, but you know, like that you have like a, a line that kind of opens a parachute out for you. You have like about 30 seconds in the air, which I thought was great. Then you sort of like hit the ground pretty hard. Um, and even though I enjoyed kind of the jumping out of the plane sort of thing, I, I used to hear all the stories about free fall parachuting and having these controllable parachutes because the, the round stuff you don't have much control over. So that, that, that seemed like a lot more fun to me. So when I uh, sort of saved up enough money, I, I, I traveled to Spain where there's a lot more sunshine in the UK uh, and I got myself qualified in a week and then it's, it sort of carried on from there. Um, I was really fortunate to to be selected to be on the Red Devils display team. Um, it's, it's kind of the equivalent of the Golden Knights in, um, in, in America. So it's, it's the British equivalent of that. And when I was with the Red Devils, we worked with the Golden Knights. Um, so I spent a good three, four years traveling around the UK, parachuting into all kinds of shows, big and small, primarily for like recruiting people into the army but, and, and kind of advertising the British army. Um, but, you know, I was really fortunate because I, I got all my kind of skydiving qualifications from that. Um, got a lot of experience in skydiving in, in that time. And uh, since, since leaving that and, and leaving the military, I'm, I'm now, um, now working full time in skydiving. So, yeah, you, you coach people or is it considered coaching with skydiving or is it like teaching? Is it like instructing? It's probably more instructing, right? So I, I, I think the, the divide is, is when you're instructing someone, you're, um, you're kind of, you're more responsible for their safety. You're um, like, like teaching someone from, from the start where you, you literally have to teach them everything about skydiving. When we say coaching within the sport of skydiving, it's more dealing with someone experienced as kind of responsible for their own safety and you're kind of teaching them skills um, so to speak. So that, that's really how, how we use it within our sport. It could be different in a lot of other kind of sports, um, but that's generally um, how, how we differentiate the two. So, you know, a main question that I'm sure everybody has regarding skydiving is how do you get around the dangers of it? Because there's unknown risks of jumping out of a plane, right? And so how do you make sure before you jump or even in the air, you, you keep your guys and you specifically safe as possible? Sure. So, I mean, it, you, you can never tr truly get rid of the danger, but, you know, we, we've been kind of doing this for, for a few decades now and, and the, the equipment has become um, a lot safer, um, procedures have become safer and, and the kind of the, the, the way we train people um, to, to kind of to, to deal with anything they may came, come up against. Um, I, I suppose ultimately for, for that first jump is that balance of like how much information you give because you can overload someone with so much information um, but you, you, clearly you need to give them enough to get through that first jump and then you kind of add more information on, onto them once they've kind of experienced that and that, that really is, is a balance but I, I think you know we're, we've refined it now over a few decades and um yeah so i i would consider skydiving to be 
pretty safe. There's uh, there's enough kind of safety parameters in there. Um, but what what can happen is as you go on to like the more um, advanced kind of forms of skydiving, and that they can then become a bit more dangerous. Yeah, and you know, I'm thinking too. A part of the the thrill of skydiving has got to be the the, uh, the known danger to it. You know, like you're free falling out of the sky, and humans don't have wings. You know, that's got to be some of the attraction to it. And like you said, yeah, especially with something like that, you probably want people to be more calm than they and frantic. So you probably do want to have a balance between being instructed correctly and being like hyper anxious about everything that you get, could go wrong, right? Absolutely, yeah, and uh, so, so a, a lot of um, kind of our training is, is is sort of practicing everything on the ground, practicing the different eventualities, um, so that when when you're actually kind of there there in the moment, you, you've got like sixty seconds and free fall, and then once once you're kind of under canopy, you, the instructors aren't with you anymore. Um, you, you may have a radio, but of course, radios don't always work. So, um, I mean, you, you do have a radio for, the, for those first few jumps. But again, you've also been taught how to kind of do everything yourself in case that radio fails. Yeah, and so specifically in the air, if something goes wrong, are you guys taught a certain way to keep your guys self calm and to fix it while free falling in the air? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and, and this is what, it, what we start with, with our students, like, like say from, um, from jump one, we kind of, we, we, we go over the, the likely scenarios if something kind of goes wrong, which it tends to be for, for, for those, um, those first jumps where, where they're kind of spinning um, or if they kind of end up on their back. So we, we teach them how to deal with those situations as well, but actually we're also trained and assessed as instructors to kind of usually get in there before um before they even deal with it to actually stop them and and get them back the right way around and and all that kind of stuff but clearly we we, we don't really talk about that with them we just teach them what they need to be doing and we're mm -hmm. worried about what we need to be doing when we're doing that yeah and so you said like on your back or if you're spinning what like I, like I said, I don't really know that much about skydiving. What is the correct form, the correct way to skydive? Um, like from the beginning when you're about to jump and then in the air specifically? Sure. So we, we teach everyone, first of all, the, uh, the, the first position we teach them is, is like a belly to earth position. We, we call it a belly flying. Um, and it, it's clearly um, because the parachute's on your back. So when you belly to earth, the parachute's on your back and it, kind of deploys skywards that's kind of how how you want to be when when you're deploying your parachute and that's the first thing we need to teach students before we do anything more advanced like intentionally being on your back or intentionally being sit flying or all that kind of stuff that's like really advanced stuff down the road but initially we, we need to get them to be stable belly flying um so that they can deploy their own parachute safely and that that's the main goal really and so if, if let's say you end up in a position where you are on your back and it's getting to that altitude where, or you're spinning, you, if you're getting to that altitude where you need to put your parachute up, what, how do you help? How do, what, what do you instruct them to do? What is the correct way to do if you are in those dangerous scenarios in the air? Uh, so, so ultimately uh, we, we, we teach them at the end of the day, you need to pull and get some sort of parachute out. Um, what, what a lot of people don't realize as well is that there's, um, there's like a backup backup device, which is um, it works on barometric pressure and it, it will, um, it will initiate your reserve for you. If you were like knocked out or um, if, if you didn't deploy a parachute, it, it, it will fire your reserve for, up for you. But that's like a absolutely like last resort kind of thing. Yeah. You guys have like backup parachutes and things like that. It's, yeah, exactly. it's fascinating because it's like, you guys almost certainly have to have, well, you guys almost, it's just definitely a sport now, but you guys definitely have to have specific techniques on how to do it. And it's correct me if I'm wrong. It's gotta be the most dangerous sport, right? Is there a more dangerous sport than skydiving? I, I would say base jumping is much more dangerous than yeah, is, and that's the one where you have like the like the the not they're not squirrels flying squirrels but like the suits that are like this where you like have like the wing kind of thing and you just kind of <clears throat> yeah. soar right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean you, you you can base jump without a wing suit like people base jump from antennas, bridges, uh, all that kind of stuff. But I mean you, you're so much closer to the ground 
There's no backup parachute because you wouldn't have time to use it anyway. There's no electronic device that will open a parachute for you. So it's literally one parachute, you pack it, but you pack it a lot more with a lot more care than you would your uh, skydiving parachute. And uh, yeah, it's, it, 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 there's, there's a lot, um, the, the parameters are a lot tighter than, than for skydiving. Do you have any <clears throat> experience with base jumping? Yeah, I, I um, for, for my 30th birthday, I, I went over to Croatia and then Italy to uh, to do um, a very reputable base course, um, 50 cal base course uh, with, with someone that I got put in touch with. Uh, so I did about 20 jumps from a bridge. Uh, and then I did about seven jumps, I think, seven, eight jumps from a cliff called Monte Branto, uh, which is about, about a 4,000 foot cliff. Uh, I might have got that one, that one wrong, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a much more intense experience than uh, than skydiving. I don't know. I feel like they're both pretty intense, if, if you ask me. But for base yeah. jumping specifically, you know, we always see it, and I've seen like su- I've, I've seen like specific people do it. But what exactly is base jumping? Because I don't think most people do. You said you can do it without a wingsuit. I don't understand. Like, what is the parameters? What is the like the basics basics of base jumping? So base jumping is it's essentially um, jumping from fixed objects um, using a parachute. So it can it, so base is an acronym. It stands for building antenna span and earth. Um, so it can be cliffs, um, bridges, that that kind of thing. Um, so I, I I have limited experience. I, I kind of you know I I hang around with with people that have a lot more experience with base jumping. Um, I I kind of did that course like i really enjoyed it I, as it happened I, I i didn't have time to kind of commit to it um and, and clearly it, it's something that the the more skydiving you're doing and the more base you're doing like the the safer you're going to be because it's like a currency thing you know if, if you're doing one skydive a year you're clearly not as current as doing like a thousand skydives a year like most professional jumpers are doing you know so um that, that, that was a big reason why i didn't kind of carry it on um, but we never know what might happen in the future. Yeah, for sure. How many, you said professionals do like a thousand, how many skydives are you doing a year? Um, so it, it, this is my first season as a it fully working in the sport and I'm, I'm hoping to hit at least uh, 500. Um, so I, I currently have about 4,000 skydives. Um, Whoa, that's, that's a lot of skydives, man. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like there's a lot of people that I kind of work with who, who kind of have a lot more than that. You know, um, uh, currently I've been doing about 250 jumps a year, but I'm hoping to obviously now work in the sport. I'll be, I'll be doing a lot more than that. And in these, in these 4,000 jumps, have you had any close encounters, any super dangerous experiences um, with skydiving or have they all been pretty routine? Um, so the, 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 there's, you know, the, the, there's the odd things. Um, I've, I've had to use my reserve about six times. Um, and the, there was one time that the, the worst one was during my opening, uh, my shoulder dislocated. So um, I, I actually had to perform all my emergency procedures with one hand. And then I had to land my reserve with one hand as well. Um, and then I was, I was kind of out of the game for about seven months, which was, it was pretty tough because it was a really nice weather summer. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the UK, but we don't have the best of weathers. And I, I missed out on a lot of good weather. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I managed to kind of get, get back to jumping. Yeah. When did that happen? Uh, do you know, I think that was about three years ago now, three, four years ago. Yeah. So you said you, how did that happen specifically? How did you dislocate your shoulder in the air? And also you said landing with one arm. How do you land with your arms? I don't know anything about that. So if you could answer um, those. So, it, so when, when, you, um, when you're controlling your parachute, uh, it, it's kind of like a wing. So when you, you have like steering toggles that you um, usually have one hand in each toggle and then you, you kind of flare them, which um, uh, slows the parachute down for, for landing. Uh, and in that case, I had to kind of make it up and have one hand in both both my toggles and kind of form a flare. Um, you got to be absolutely shitting yourself in that situation, yeah? It, 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 to be honest, it, it was one where, like, you, you don't really have time to at the time. It's just when you get down and start yeah. thinking about it. Um, but 
I didn't actually feel any pain for about 40 minutes after. Well, I got it. You got to say your adrenaline's probably through the roof, right? Like you're, you're falling. So where, what, what's the height you guys jump at? Uh, so it's generally about 12 and a half thousand feet, 13,000 feet. And you fall at, I don't know if you know how many per seconds you fall, how many hundred feet you fall per second. Uh, it's about 120 miles an hour. That's, that's kind of how we describe it. Yeah. And so, the, yeah. And so like, well, yeah, if you like dive like that, you always see those people going like that, like super like diving and stuff. Um, but yeah, like you got to. I mean, in, in general, I mean, for a professional, someone who does it like you, it's probably less, like you're probably less angst and less adrenaline than the, the average person. Like if I just went and jumped out of a plane, but you're probably, st- you still got to have that adrenaline because it's always in the back of your mind. Like the ground is ha- 12,000 feet away. And so like your adrenaline, when you, when you feel that dislocation, you're like, oh, that's going to hurt later. Your, your body's in, f- in fight mode, right? It's got to be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, it- yeah. Yeah, we were uh, we were right right deep diving into it. Um, uh, I think we were talking about uh, we were just talking about how I had to land with a dislocated shoulder. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So with that, like um, we were talking about close encounters specifically, but with that um, landing with a dislocated shoulder, you were saying that we were talking about adrenaline and being hyper. Yeah. Uh, adrenaline and we were talking about how like for someone like me it might not be that it might be super adrenaline you're saying you like to jump calm and you're almost calm so if you want to just jump back into being like how you're how you were saying like when you jump it's almost like you want to be calm now definitely yeah and and, and, and even when when you do your your first jump you know the the, the calmer you are um the, the the better you can you can process the the kind of fight or flight reflex doesn't really help you out in that situation um uh, being kind of relaxed and being aware of your, your body as you're in free fall uh, will allow you to be in control and and all that kind of stuff so um but but of, of course when you first start your adrenaline is is much higher than than when you've been jumping for a while have you ever been bungee jumping do you know yeah well before i started skydiving and i i have to say that was probably more terrifying than skydiving my uh some of my close friends up in oregon they working at a bungee company but they bungee jump all the time that's like like what they do all and right. they always try to get me to come jump and i'm like no that's just doesn't sound like something that i'm that interested into is jumping with like a like almost like a cord attached to you yeah but it's like you don't even you know that it, you have to rely on something like yeah you have to rely on a parachute but you pull it and stuff like that you know when sure. you're skydiving but with bungee jumping, you're all, it's all on the, the material that's a part of your body. You're just falling. Absolutely, yeah. And you're so much closer to the ground. It really, um, it's much more terrifying than being like thousands of feet, feet up, you know. Yeah, um, some people get like dip their head into the water when they jump and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I don't think, I, don't think I'd like that. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, I really enjoyed it, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just with parachute. Well, you specifically, you like jumping out of things. Like, that's your kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you wouldn't say you're afraid of heights, obviously. So if you put me on on top of a house uh, where I might fall, then yeah, I'm 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 afraid of heights. But if I'm like thousands of feet up, in a plane kind of looking, looking out the door and I know I've got a parachute on and I've, you know, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable in that environment. If that makes sense, if if I was by by an open door in a plane without a parachute, I'd be just as terrified as anyone else, you know. Yeah, but that's almost like that's not really the heights that's scary though. That's like the free fall and then immediate impact of the ground, you know. Um, exactly. But you do you almost like feel relaxed when you're free falling in the air sometimes now. Yeah, ab- absolutely, and especially when when you yeah. Um, performing like more advanced kind of free fall skills then you know being relaxed is, is kind of the, the only way that you, you can perform like, like much more um intricate skills you know like if, you, if you're all tense and um uh, nervous it, it's much more difficult to perform them yeah for sure um specifically you this is a very metaphysical question but has skydiving and jumping out of planes and seeing the ground and seeing the earth in such different ways change your thoughts about uh, humanity and death and everything like that 
I mean, yeah, I, I, I suppose w- w- without I, I, having not really given it that much thought apart from right now, then it, yeah, d- d- definitely. Um, it, it, it's kind of given me, I don't know, but maybe more of a kind of live and let live kind of attitude and, um, and, and especially because I, I in, in what I do, I, I kind of have to deal with, with people from all walks of life. Um, so uh, it's just, just being, being more accept, uh, accepting of people. Um, uh, and it, it, it's, it's kind of rewarding, you know, like say when you're taking people on tandems that um, g- generally a lot of people that, that go on tandems, they kind of, they want to experience that once. They're usually terrified of it. And um, kind of helping someone through that situation is is pretty cool. Uh, I think I think the oldest person I've taken was like a, an eighty eight year old um, lady, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, so, so that, that that kind of stuff is rewarding, you know. No, yeah, for sure. And like, it's gotta, like I'm saying, like it's gotta change your mindset. Like doing it, doing all these jumps, being almost relaxed, seeing like the absolute fear in these people's eyes because. You've got to see so like people got to black out in the air, right? Uh, I've I've never had anyone black out. Really? Um, no, no I've, I've never had any anyone black out. So I've I've had you know I've had people kind of like freeze a little bit and kind of not not react to or how how I kind of want them. But of course that that's kind of what I'm there for uh, in a sense. Um, but I suppose you know, like w- w- one thing we've been talking a lot about the activity itself. But what what kind of um, doesn't get mentioned enough is like the the sort of community of skydiving. It's it's quite a small sport anyway, and it's um, the the community of it is is really something special, and you kind of feel very welcome and part of something from from when you first kind of start jumping and start going to the drop zone more regularly. Um, so yeah, so that, I, that's also like like a big part of it, which I I, I never expected. I, I you know I kind of when I first got into it around about like twenty, I just I loved doing things like bungee jumping, just anything that seemed a bit crazy, uh, and I, I didn't expect to re- really fall into the community of it. You know, no, yeah, and it's the community's got to be tightening almost with all those super hyper dangerous activities, parkour, extreme parkour, skydiving, sure, yeah. uh, cliff diving, bungee jumping, all those extremely, a lot of them in, entail jumping, but they got to be super tight knit too, because like, you know, it's, it's a relevant fact that, I mean, skydiving is probably the safest, I would say maybe bungee jumping, but um, you can, mm-hmm. people, people lose people in those sports, you know, um, all the time, Absolutely. So to not to, to not have that tight knit relationship. It, it, it would make it so much more difficult you would say right no i i absolutely agree you know I, even if it's something like like very small like if, if you're kind of getting ready to go on a jump and some strangers just notice something on your equipment that maybe you haven't noticed or something like that you, you got to kind of like look out for each other and um yeah I, I totally didn't expect that side of it when i when i got into it i just wanted to do something crazy you know as, as you do when you're younger. No, yeah. And yeah, that's the cool part about something that, that's so intricate like that, I feel like, is almost the community side. And, and what you get from it, a side of the jumping and a side of the extreme rush, you know, the endorphins, you get this side of family almost. You can do that with anything. It doesn't have to be dangerous sports. You can get that really with anything. But specifically, when you find like a, with, like what you're saying, like an extreme sport like this, it's got almost got to feel like, because not everybody can do 4,000 jumps a year. Or four thousand jumps in however long you've been jumping, you know, or a thousand. Yeah. Jumps. Most people can't. I would say most people do one jump for their whole life or none. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like the average person probably hasn't jumped. It's like point five probably is the average of yeah. jumps. And so, yeah. like, to be able to do that, it, it probably wouldn't one hundred percent brings people together. You know. It, yeah, absolutely does. Yeah, and I, I think that's as part of why why I've kind of stayed in it as, as long as possible and now i'm at a point where i'm sort of giving back a little bit more and um i'm, I'm really enjoying that aspect of things as well so it's, uh, it's very rewarding yeah and we, so we we're talking about the wind tunnel what is the wind mm. tunnel exactly and how does it work and, and you said it's used for training basically right is it used for training sure. tricks is it used for just instructing like young people who don't know how to sky drive what is it specifically sure. used for um so 
I think I, I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I, I think primarily it's, it's kind of people having like a taster of it, and it's in a slightly safer environment than kind of jumping out of a plane. Um, but of course, like the skydiving community have seen the the benefits of you know just training all aspects of, of kind of free fall skills. Uh, but but more more recently, it's um, it, it's become its its own kind of thing as as well as using the wind tunnel to improve skydiving there's there's been um disciplines and competitions that have come out of it there's like artistic kind of stuff and um the, the great thing about it is it's much more spectator friendly um and that's uh, that's probably the challenge with skydiving so whenever we do um and then there's so many kind of sub disciplines to skydiving especially when you come to compete in skydiving which I, I also do um, anything that sort of goes on in free fall. Uh, the only really way you can spectate it is someone wears a camera and then that kind of gets put on a screen. So, cause it, it's obviously happening quite far away. Um, as a, another aspect of uh, skydiving I, I do, if, you, if you've looked at my Instagram page, it's like, it's called swooping. It's where you're landing small, fast parachutes kind of along the ground and like along water and there's different ways to compete with, with that. And that, that, that's a lot more spectator friendly um, r- rather than any, any kind of anything in free fall. Yeah, you're, you're saying competing in skydiving. How is that point generated? Like how do they score um, specific competitions for skydiving? Sure. So, um, so, so some of them are like artistic related. So it's maybe how – gymnastics or ice skating or something like that would would be rated on kind of ha- how it looks um it's, uh, how, how i kind of compete is I, I have a team of four um and a, a fifth guy who's filming and we basically get given um uh, a, a load of formations to kind of complete like as, as fast as possible uh and then so uh, obviously the the team that kind of completes the most formations is usually doing like 10 jumps in in a competition and it's it's all kind of added up so that's a bit more objective whereas like the artistic stuff is a bit more subjective um in terms of like the swooping with the parachute landing fast parachutes so that's kind of distance and speed uh, and accuracy so again that's um very objective um, but then there's also some kind of like freestyle stuff as well, like competitions, which is it's a bit more subjective done on, you know, difficulty and kind of how, how it looks, uh, which I, I haven't really got into the, the freestyle side of things. But I'm, I'm just uh, just dabbling with, with the swooping side of things at the moment, speed, distance and accuracy. Yeah, that's crazy, too. Is mm. it more dangerous to compete or is it more dangerous to do be uh, non like be a first diver you know first time jumping out of a plane is it more dangerous to it the first time to be not that um well uh intricate in the system or is it more dangerous to do like the speed distance kind of things i, th- I think it's it's more more dangerous like the, the way that the, the more advanced kind of parachuting you're doing um especially when, when, when you're landing um you're landing parachutes which are probably a third, if not like a quarter of the size of um, what you would do on your first jump. So clearly you, you would go down in parachute sizes over like a long period of time. But yeah, so, so the, the parachute I, I'm i flying is, is much smaller than when I first started out. So therefore it's also much faster. So kind of your, your reactions have to be better. Your whole experience has to be uh, a lot higher. So, like, just you specifically, how do you stay calm in the air in the free fall? How did you, what did you learn from doing these 4,000 jumps? What are some tips that you learned along the way that people can take into their lives if they want to go do extreme dangerous jumpings and things like that? Uh, well, certainly breathing techniques help, help me. Um, and, and certainly um, having a systematic approach to, to everything I do. So, you know, if, if I am going to do something – that it's possibly you know, like risky then you know i'll do things like i'll, I'll make sure i kind of check everything and, and don't leave everything to chance put a lot of planning and consideration into things um and and that that kind of helps me like execute things in a systematic way rather than 
let's just jump out and see what happens if if that makes sense no it does make sense um you want to plan for anything really and especially with these like really 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 hyper angst situations like um skydiving um i mean being a professional and being a person who is an instructor and things like that and is competing it's got to be more of a like oh i want to go do it you don't really think about all the danger side effects every time you go out and jump um but you definitely got to be super careful right like you know i have yeah, cool. football i don't i don't got to go out to, every time i go to the field i don't got to be extremely careful on what i bring and what i how i do techniques and so that's got to bring some aspect of your sport. Like that's got to be some of the draw too, is the extreme carefulness you got to be around it or all else can fail, you know, not just the danger of it. Like, yeah, everyone knows you could die, but also just what can fail, especially with competing, you're in the air, you know, like you could, you like, you can dislocate your shoulder. You can easily land wrong and break your legs, right? Like countless things can yeah, in that sport. Yeah, no, of course, yeah, um, and, and and even sometimes when when you've um, when when you've taken all the precautions, there, there's still no like no guarantees. However, you know we we, we do um, our, our best to kind of minimize all, all those risks and uh, and kind of th- think ahead of all, all the different things that could go wrong. Have you ever had any close encounters with like crashing? You said like you're dislocating shoulder, but have you any close encounters of like maybe landing too fast, landing too hot, or just not parachute not opening at all? Uh, so uh, m- most of my malfunctions, so I, I have had six malfunctions, and they've all been like some parachute ha- has come out, but uh, because I jumped those very high performance parachutes, that they ha- they are more uh, have more of a tendency of. Um, uh, spinning up very quickly so at that at that point you just have to decide very quickly you know I'm, I'm not gonna fix this I need to use my reserve um, so I've, I've had to do that six times um, out of my whole 4,000 jumps uh, statistically I think that's a little bit on the higher side but because of the the more high performance parachutes um, it's, it's just something to be expected um, what's the yeah, uh, oh no finish what you're gonna say yeah, I mean, in in terms of crashing, so the, the, you know the, the the whole swooping discipline, it's um, it's essentially you're you're kind of diving your parachute at the ground, and using that speed to kind of um, surf along the ground. Um, so purely it, it, by by its nature, it, it, you are kind of attacking at the ground and kind of yeah using your experience to to kind of level off at, at kind of ground level so um the, 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 there's much more added danger to that so a lot more experience is, is required um and certainly um a, a very um gradual build up to that so i i didn't kind of just decide one day i was going to do that straight away I, I've, I've kind of done it through gradually reducing the size of my parachute over 4000 jumps and gradually making my parachute go faster towards the ground and it certainly wasn't an overnight kind of process it's it's been a long process get getting to that yeah and something that like you got to be more advanced to do something like that too and you know how how you i don't know if you said this how far away from the ground are you uh, so it's, it's at ground level um so we, we usually do it over water which is a bit safer yeah but, but you have to you know you have to sort of like drag your foot through the water and stuff like that to, to score um for, for that particular round um so you know you like the, clearly the the, the fa- faster guy wins but then is is the added added risk so yeah that's the uh the nature of it yeah that's have you seen any like crashes or anything happen while you're doing swooping not specifically you yeah so i i, I haven't yet um but, but yeah the, you know especially at competitions it, there's usually you know what one or two crashes um uh, i haven't seen any like major injuries at, at competitions I, I i have seen injuries you know happen through swooping throughout my career um definitely uh some of them quite serious no, for sure. And how fast are these guys going? Um, so probably by, by the time you're at ground level, you can still be going about 60 miles an hour. And, and some of the guys that are really like top in the world are probably going faster than that. Um, so it's, it's pretty fast, yeah. 
And like, how are you angled in these? I don't know if you said that specifically. Where are you angled? How are you angled with the ground and with your parachute? So you fl- you fly in long level with the ground, so you know the parachute's above you, and um, yeah, so you you sort of surfing along the ground. So you're almost like moving like just straight up and down, like you're almost standing on the water kind of thing. It, yeah, essentially, yeah. That's fantastic, man. I gotta check that out. You said it's on your Instagram page. Yeah, there should be some stuff on my Instagram. Yeah, and uh, I've actually got some stuff recently to post. Um, nice, so yeah. you know, but but by its nature, and you know, as it, it, even just by my description, but it's it's definitely much more spectator friendly. Yeah, uh, and sure. I, I was I was definitely going along and watching swooping competitions way before I kind of did any of them myself, because um, it, it's just it's just awesome to watch. You know, so no, yeah, and. So how do you get over like, you know, in those hyper adrenaline situations, like when you're like in these sports, you know, how do you, cause you don't want to score and you want to have the best score in these competitions. How do you get sure. that adrenaline as low as possible? So you can like be calm and have the fine tooth um, like tricks and things that you need to do in these competitions. Because I feel like I'd be shitting myself the whole entire time. No, exactly. Yeah. So, so first and foremost is you can't let your ego get too ahead of yourself. So if, if sometimes if you've kind of got it wrong and it's just not going to work out for you, then just kind of have a safe landing and kind of don't get any points on that round or get very few points. Um, but aside from that, uh, you know, d- definitely concentrating on the process rather than the outcome definitely helps because it's kind of you have to do a lot of work to kind of put yourself in the right position over the ground and all that kind of stuff so if you kind of get immersed in the process it certainly helps rather than just fixating on the outcome Uh, I think you you hear that a lot in sports but this is definitely it's definitely one situation I found where that that really helps you Um, trying to kind of stay as relaxed as possible as well it certainly helps. You're definitely not going to, unless you're a sociopath, you're definitely not going to lose that adrenaline. And, but all all sports are like that though. Like, like I played basketball, football, soccer, and volleyball growing up. And, you know, in those late moments of the game, which is the late moments basically are when you're actually doing the swooping for you, you're in those Mm. hyper angst, like you're in the hyper adrenaline state and then you're almost like in go mode. So I guess the one way I would assume that you, you do this is training over training. um, And by natural, your body's just going to take over muscle memory. And I feel like also you guys can do some crazy things because of the added danger and the added level of adrenaline that brings, because when you're adrenaline and your muscle memory takes over your body performs better but if you're even at that higher level of adrenaline just one of two things that could happen you could freeze you know and really hurt yourself absolutely or mess up or you could overperform and do something that no one's seen before i feel like yeah definitely no i i, I I'd, I'd agree with you um yeah so i i think just like um just like a lot of sports there's you know the, the, there's the there's that optimum level of adrenaline, isn't there? Or, or optimum level of uh, activation, I think is like the, the, the proper term from it. Like, like clearly if you're like, you, you can be maybe too relaxed for, for, for something, you know, and you need to kind of, it, it, that's the challenge really in, in any sport is just finding that balance of um, keep, you know, keeping yourself at the correct activation level, not too much, not too little. So um, I'm a kicker, right? I'm a kicker and football, mm-hmm. I'm a punter, but I kicked, I've, I've kicked too before, like field goals and stuff. And there's something happens with kicking that um, I haven't found in any other sport where I call it the blackout moment. And it's where you're in a late game situation. Maybe you're kicking the game. Mm-hmm. Kick. I don't know if you know anything about American football, but. N- n- not too much, but I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up. It's cool. So, you know, kickers kick through the uprights, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, so in the late game, if you're going to kick for a game winning kick or something like that, um, or a game tying kick, you freeze and you, not really like you freeze in like a bad way, but you black out and then your muscle just takes over and you don't really remember anything until after the kick. Right. Um, 
So I call that the blackout moment because it's like your hyper adrenaline. You're like at the highest level of adrenaline you can get in your sport. It's like you're, the game's on the line, you know? And mm. does that happen when, with swooping? Does that happen with competition and skydiving? Do you almost have a blackout moment where you, where you almost, your muscle memory takes over and then you're like, at the end, you're like, oh my God, I'm over. It's over. Yeah, sure. And I, I think it comes down to, um, you know, uh, w- w- once you've kind of trained something to a high level, and this is something I, I, you know, cause I'm clearly interested in sports performance and stuff like that, but w- once you train something to a high level, you can actually overthink things if you don't kind of just let your body kind of take over. Um, and I, I, th- I think it's, it's certainly the case, um, the case with that. Um, that is, is one uh, one kind of little, little tip that's always stuck with me. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Travis Pastrana. Um, I've heard the name, but I don't... Mo- motocross guy. Oh, um, okay, so, yeah. Uh, I, I kind of came up randomly, like like five, five tips to kind of competition or whatever. But the, the one that really stuck with me is kind of like, like train, uh, or sorry, compete as you train. So, for instance, if you're like, I don't know, if you're kind of coming straight from work and training and you're really tired and, and whatever when you go to that competition if you like well rested and kind of you're competing not as you're training that that can be just as bad because you can you, you can maybe have like too you're putting in too much in, into something whereas normally if you if you're used to training tired and possibly competing that same way is just going to like replicate everything um, I, I think I don't know if I've made the best, uh, um, uh, but best job of describing that. No, but, you did. That's fascinating, yeah. man. I was thinking while you were saying that, like the way I train is I train after work. You know, I, I get stronger after work, but that's me mm. weightlifting. And then I go and I and like even camp and everything. We train. We have we're at, I'm in college. So I'm a college kicker. So we after classes we're tired, but then we go to games. Mm. And, p.m and we're all rested you know and i haven't thought yeah. about that before training mm. like that's that could be also as 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 um not effective is and that's why professional athletes are so are so like um dominant i guess is because they get to train rested and they get to play rested so they're all that's all exactly they that's fascinating exactly. i haven't even thought about yeah. that before I mean that, that that's that's always kind of stuck with me. I, I suppose say saying in your situation is if if you're always training after work and you used to put in a certain amount of effort in in your kick, if you then like are nicely rested and finally had a good night's sleep before a game, then you put too much effort into a kick, then maybe you kind of like gonna miss or something, you know. So yeah, so that, that, that that's always kind of stuck with me. Um, but I've, 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 I've always used that as an excuse to like to party at competitions because I party during training. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a good way to segue into this for all sports. There's performance enhancing drugs, but I don't know if that's the case with skydiving. Is there a performance enhancing drug? Maybe not necessarily steroids, but is there a performance enhancing drugs that people use to enhance their skydiving ability? Uh, I'm I'm not aware of anything like that. So I I'm, I, I know that at, at uh, the competitions I've I've entered, uh, even though I've I've never been drug tested at a competition, that um, you do kind of sign an agreement that it is possible to be to be drug tested. So we're definitely a, a drug free sport. Um, so I uh, as well, you know, I, so I I, I work for. Um, a company called flight one, which we have like a drug zero tolerance policy for, for drugs as well. Um, but yeah, so, um, I'm, I'm not aware of any performance enhancing drug that, that could maybe help you for skydiving, but yeah, if, if there was, we, we'd probably be getting tested for it. Um, specifically, do you think anti-anxiety medication would be a, um, a performance enhancing drug for skydiving? Um, I, I I I can't think what how that would be maybe safe for for, for anything like that. I mean I, I'm I'm not I'm not familiar with, with what those drugs would kind of um, give you or, or what effect that has on you. But um, I mean the the, the way I, I would imagine it is you know, like you, you you want to be kind of aware of everything's going on and, and reacting well. So I, I certainly wouldn't advocate any kind of yeah. any any drug that um, i wouldn't either the only thing i was no. thinking was like you know what is the thing that 
what prohibits you from doing your best in a skydiving competition, it might be that fear, you know, and so yeah. small doses of anti anxiety medication could loosen you up um, and make you perform better. I, I suppose the, the, the simplest answer was uh, if, if you, if you wouldn't have that drug while you were driving, you probably wouldn't want it while you were skydiving. I think that's, the, the easiest way to answer. I mean, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too aware of what what those kind of what, what those yeah. drugs do to your body or to your sort of mental state or anything like that. But yeah, yeah. I was just asking because, like, specifically, like, there's different drugs that per, that ad, 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 advance um, specific uh, games. So, like, beer pong, for example, drinking makes you better at beer pong because it loosens you up and makes your shot better. Like, like that's not really, a, I sure. mean, listen, if you're listening right now, if someone's listening to this right now, and you're like, I'm a fucking beer pong player. Don't say some stupid shit about it. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not a sport. It's a sport, but like, and then you get like steroids with um, football and really any sport and baseball and baseball's also got the, like the, the pine tar that this makes the ball sticky. So it rotates a half a quarter inch more. Um, I'm guessing soccer or fo- football in your case. Yeah. Is, Oh wait! First off, isn't England playing tomorrow? Are you an England fan? Well, so I'm, I'm certainly supporting England. I, I'm, I'm I'm generally not not a soccer or, or football guy, but you know when when it's like a national game, international competition, and yeah. you kind of you kind of have to come together and unified. Yeah, so I I, I will be watching it. I, better I, say, I found yeah. it difficult to watch it so far, but uh, I mean I, I've I've got a I've got yeah. to show up for the final, don't I? So, what's your favorite sport? Skydiving. Yo, um, duh, Colin, yeah. jump, <laughs> go jump out of the yeah. off the plane right now with him. Like, of course, <laughs> that's, of course that's your uh, favorite sport. Um, what's your favorite team sport? Is what I was really trying to ask. Um, so I, I've, I've I've never been like um, into kind of like what, what I suppose you describe like like ball sports or kind of things like that. I've, I've always. But the the stuff I like is kind of um, the extreme, you know, like going fast, like snowboarding, that that, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think as well for me, I, I just don't think I could concentrate for like ninety minutes. In fact, I I know I can't because you know when when I did like football or whatever yeah. basketball at school, I generally like uh, that's why skydiving is so great for me because I, I I have to concentrate for like a couple of minutes at a time. Yeah, so it, that that works a lot better for me. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I, I certainly l- like watching uh, football when, when when England are playing in international games. Are you uh, from definitely. England? You said you're from Britain, but isn't there like four countries in Britain? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so for, from England. You're from England. Okay. Uh, yeah. I talked to a sculptor named Ollie. God, I can't remember his last name, but he's from Northern mm-hmm. England, and his okay. accent was thick. Was very thick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you guys have specific all over Great Britain? Is there like specific dialects and specific accents that you guys have? Yeah, I mean it, it, it's crazy like how much the the accents vary in, in the UK. Like even when you go from like a couple of cities that are maybe fifty miles apart, um, yeah, I, I still sometimes can't get my head around how how diverse the accents are in such a small country. Um, you know, effectively a country the size of one of your states um, yeah. varies so much. Yeah. Yeah, and I just have the standard American accent you would say, right? Yeah. Is this what you would consider yeah. an American accent? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, so you're from California, are you? Or? I'm from Las Vegas, which is right outside of California. It's okay, yeah, yeah. And then I go to school in Oregon. I've been there a few times. And then I'm <laughs> – nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, then I'm, and then I go to school in Oregon, which is right above California. So I'm West Coast. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, nice, yeah. Yeah, okay. this is like the West Coast dialect. But I think we, yeah. Bobby Americans, like to say this is the American accent because of the movies. This is the accent because of Hollywood. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The only other it, it's easy to follow, definitely, yeah. Yeah, and the other only other accents really in America. There's the Southern draw, like the y'all, you know, like the cowboy kind of sound like this. Yeah, and then there's the um, like the the New Yorker and the the yeah. Eastern Coast. Those are like the only really three, and then there's like yeah. The, People always like talk about the Canadian, like, oh, it's Canadians, and then that's how they talk. But, um, yeah, but yeah, this I would consider the accents fascinate me. I've talked to a guy from South Africa who has like almost like a, a Australian accent, and then I've talked to an Australian, I've talked to you're from England, I've talked to Northern England, and it's like we all have yeah. different accents, but like you guys yeah. all have different accents, and like 
not that you in the Northern England or live so far away. Cause you probably don't. It's just like most people I talk to from America sound exactly like this. It's, it's crazy to me how like in Europe, especially how accents are so diverse. Like you were saying, like accents like Absolutely. so fast. And then in like America, like, unless you live like on the East coast and the South, you basically sound like this. Yeah. There's, there's not as much uh, variation. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. No, but you know, first off, if I'm ever in England, I'm going to come skydiving. I just want you to know that. But Do it. Um, I, I, I have to say that the weather is a lot better where you are. So you, you will have a much better chance of, <laughs> I will say though, it's 120 this week here. Really? Yeah, it's extremely uh, hot. Maybe a bit too hot. Yeah, yeah. well, California's, California's going through some heat right now, but yeah. it's probably like closer to the ocean. It's probably closer to 70s, 80s, which is pretty good weather. Right. Yeah, yeah that, that's a lot better. I mean, that, that's exactly why. So, skydiving is definitely more seasonal in the UK. Um, even though some people try and kind of jump throughout the year, you definitely not jumping as much kind of November to February. Um, and that's, that's kind of where the wind tunnel comes in with us. Whereas all my friends over, over on the West coast, they, they're like jumping all the year round, you know, so yeah, friends in, uh, very jealous. West coast? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's de- you know, de- a few people. Uh, so, you know, um, especially bef- before COVID, I, I, I traveled to California to jump quite a lot because there's just so much great skydiving happening there. And, and the weather's, almost guaranteed to be awesome all the time whereas we, we don't we're, we're not as fortunate with that uh, over in the uk what is if you could give me your description what is the difference between american lifestyle and a uk lifestyle um well so, so yeah that's, that's quite a difficult question because i've only really experienced america uh you know just fleeting visits of like a couple of weeks maximum um different i, I to be honest I, I think there's more similarities and differences uh, you know mm. where, wherever i kind of travel to there's, there's definitely more more similarities and differences is generally you know pe- people just trying to trying to do what they do yeah you know? i just like i was i was wondering because like you know I also wonder how America is portrayed in the news of other countries, right? Because like everything that's going on right now and, and how like, it's just this extremely large country, you know, like if you really think about the vast like landscape of the United States, most people live in California or Texas, Florida, New York, but there's like 50 States, you know, we got a vast, vast country. And so I always wonder what, like how other countries portray the American lifestyle and how Americans act and think. And because like, you always think like, Oh, if you like the Irish, like the, the, for like us, like the Irish like to drink. Right. Um, or, um, it's really the only one I know, but like, I always think like, are Americans fat? Like how are you, how is America portrayed in your eyes? Yeah. I mean, you know, so, uh, I mean, I, I think I've probably, only visited about one percent of America, and uh, like you say, like the, 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 all those states, like like differ so much. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so it's, it's quite quite a difficult question. Like like for, for me, I, I I you know I've I've always kind of in, enjoyed traveling to America, and, and certainly certainly enjoyed the weather. Um, I've I've always found it like a kind of very very, very friendly, um, kind of welcoming. Uh, sort of people you know um yeah especially skydiving is probably dope in california like where did you skydive like what city were you in la uh so, so lake elsinore which is uh, i'd say uh, about an hour away um lake elsinore yeah, yeah. it's um yeah re- really big scene in skydiving around around that southern california mm-hmm. area oh i'm sure dude i Everything that you can do anything down there. Surfing is really big down there. Snowboarding, if you go up north, is big there. Yeah. I snowboard. Um, there's a lot of you can do anything in California. I love California. It's just too many people for me. Yeah. Specifically, I hate traffic. I I hate traffic. Yeah. And California. My sister lives down in San Diego. I don't know if you know where oh, San yeah, Diego yeah. is. It's like 
really low. It's yeah. like almost close to Mexico. That's right. Um, she lives down there and it's beautiful down there. I just visited her not too long ago. It's three and a half hours from Vegas, but it's so many people. There's so many people always. And it's just like, I like cities that are like a lot of people, like, but one to 2 million people, not 40 million people, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. What? How many people live in London? I, I, I would I would have to look that up. But it's it's, it's got to be in the millions, I think. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, 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 the, the, the one thing I've, I've noticed is that we're, we're just so much more, like, crowded than you guys. Like, you, you guys just just space out because you you have um you, you have you have all the space we we're, we're much more mm-hmm. crowded like i you know I, I always notice like a lot of your houses are just like one story whereas everything's like a lot more built up everything we're, we're all like everything's a bit closer to each other we kind of live, live a bit closer to each other and yeah mm-hmm. just generally generally a bit more crowded because we, we can't we can't branch out as much as you guys yeah. Well, yeah. And right now there's California has been in a drought for a while. Like they like no water, the Southern Nevada and Arizona are getting super hot. And so a lot of people are moving to like Idaho, which is right above Nevada. Um, and um, like Colorado, I don't know if you know where Denver is or yeah. Like people, are moving, yeah, roughly, to Den- yeah. people yeah. moving to Texas. I know you know where Texas is. And yeah, yeah. Everyone's branching out. I, I want to move to Texas. I want to move um, to Austin and, yeah, it, it is cool. That's one thing I will say about living in America. But the thing about you guys is you guys can move countries like that if you really wanted to, right? Well, I, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah it's like, and just, just, yeah, j- 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 just like how you guys can sort of like move around to states and yeah, you, yeah. you know, like but mo- I think the far, furthest reaches of Europe are probably two hours away. Yeah, and I wanted – I've never been to Europe, but I wanted to go next year. I was going to go to Greece from philosophy, oh, wow. but it, it fell through. But I want yeah, to go yeah. and like do like the train just through all the cities and like go visit Paris and visit London, uh, London and visit like all those places just so I can like oh, absolutely. It. Um, so my heritage before I was an American it was um, German, yeah. Polish, and Irish. So I want to go visit all those places and and. Um, you know. Absolutely. That, 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 that is one thing I've, I've noticed about like whenever I speak to anyone in America is that they're all quite aware of like, like their heritage and maybe where um, certain members of their like family from quite a long time ago, where, where they come from. Whereas like, I, I, I don't know that much, you know, many generations down, but I've noticed like a lot of you guys really, you, you know, a lot more of that, which is, uh, is, is fascinating. I think it's because we know there was a start, right? 1700s, yeah, exactly. 1800s, there was a start. And so for you guys, it's like, who knows, you know? Like, if you live in Europe, it's like most people either left Europe, but we don't know when they came there, right? And yeah. so I think that's the whole thing is like, like we don't know. Like, the, the, what part of the American draw and part of being American is that we're so diverse. Um, we're still predominantly white, I'm pretty sure it's getting Mm. close but there's every race here like there is it's extreme diversity here um and so it's one of the cool things about it is knowing that you had family elsewhere and we all came here to make this extreme melting pot that's well in chaos right now but usually beautiful you know (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, man i think this was a good conversation to have thank you so much for coming on We're, we're a little bit over an hour right now yeah, no, I've I've really enjoyed it. It's, it's been my first podcast, so uh, thanks for the experience. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, and no, I've really enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun talking to you, man. I'm I'm really gonna check out your swooping. I I I'm so excited for that. I'm gonna check. Awesome. Out. Um, yeah, let me know, man. I'll let you know if I'm in ever down over there, and I want to come jump in or something. I'm yeah, definitely please I'm, do, and, and likewise. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna. Well, you'll be here probably before I am. I live really close to california um hopefully yeah, if, if travel starts lifting yeah yeah um but yeah man this is this has been a lot of fun uh thank you so much i'll let you know all the information when it's out and everything and you have a, a great day man all right awesome thanks very much yep see you soon man talk to you soon all Bye. right